Hello, everybody, and welcome for uh, this third day of conference and the third keynote speech of our conference. And uh, uh, Professor Joachim Pech asked me to keep this introduction very short because uh, uh, his uh, talk will be uh, long. <laughs> And uh, therefore, I will not uh, rob him of any of uh, the precious minutes available for this talk. Only I'd like to say that it is uh, an extra pleasure for us to welcome him at this university, especially because this conference is organized, as you know, by the film studies department of this university and because uh, uh, all the works of uh, Professor Joachim Pech on uh, cinematic intermediality have have been such an influence on uh, people working uh, in uh, film studies. So welcome, and uh, uh, just a few uh, facts about him that you probably already know. Uh, uh, he used to be a professor at uh, the University of Constance until his retirement in 2007, and uh, he's also the author of uh, numerous articles and uh, several books, and editor of several books on cinematic intermediality, intermediality between uh, literature and film, literature and new media, television and uh, film, and uh, uh, author of several articles on the theory of intermediality in film and the analysis of intermediality in film. I will not uh, 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 now uh, list all these titles because you have some of these uh, uh, covers of his books uh, on the PowerPoint here and leave uh, the floor to Professor Pech and uh, let him talk. Thank you for being here and accepting our invitations. It is a real pleasure and honor. Thank you, Agnes, for that wonderful Congress and the opportunity for me to speak here on that Congress. Thank you very much. Now I start immediately um, because its title is Scanty Words of the Thrifty Man in German, Karge Worte des Sparsamen, painted by Paul Klee in 1924 oil and watercolor on paper, 45 centimeter by uh, 29.5 centimeter. Unfortunately, the Berggrün collection at the Staatliche Museum zu Berlin, where the picture currently resides, refused to make the painting available for our colloquium. And therefore it must remain in its place on the museum wall. Nevertheless, although it's not the original, I can show you photographic reproductions that depict this painting by Paul Klee, but which of course cannot be the picture itself. In the following discussion, I will refer to such reproductions as images, that is, images of the original picture. Printed on paper, the poster and the postcard offered at the museum shop, for instance, are color prints featuring rather different color tones and formats. The great number of copies of these prints is significant. In contrast, the original picture hanging in its place on the museum wall in Berlin is the only irreproducible specimen. What recurs in the prints is not the picture, but rather the image, the representative surface that obviously can be detached from the picture and reproduced in many ways with different media properties. The images on the posters and postcards are not the picture that they depict, even though we frequently make this substitution for the sake of convenience. But they signify it in that the images refer back to the picture. They have the shape and the figure of the picture such that they formulate the picture that they signify or represent. These images are apparently capable of multiplying themselves with different media properties. In this sense, the extreme case is the digital form of an image which can employ any format, color, nuance, and media connection in processes of intermediality. Just a moment. 
Of course, this is not the picture hanging on the wall in Berlin, but this is an image of that picture. And I have some, just to, to, prove, my, uh, to prove it, I have some more. <laughs> <laughs> this is also the picture. And I have one more. Uh, I had some problems to bring here. Uh, It has not the format of the, of, of the picture uh, hanging in Berlin, but it has a special format, but uh, the format of a poster. So, these all are images of the one picture in hanging uh, in Berlin. Um, this is the way you can see the picture hanging in Berlin on the, wa uh, on, uh, on the wall. Um, it's a photograph of the picture now. You see, as you can see it on the wall in Berlin, and so on, and so on. Okay. In the following discussion, I will refer to such reproductions as images. Uh, oh, I told you. The following considerations will address the intermediality of images. The fact that I do not refer here to the intermediality of pictures goes directly to the core of my argumentation. My thesis is that there cannot be an intermediality of pictures, a term that I will define in a moment. However, an intermediality of images seems to be possible. For the intermediality of images, certain requirements of the technique play a significant role this refers to the creation of inauthenticities, uneigentliche or quasi-pictures, which in the following analysis I will call matrices. These matrices are fundamental elements in the operation of the technical imaging process functioning as intermediate images or Zwischenbilder for both the production of images as well as the integration into other media processes. Now first, pictures. For several reasons, this discussion about images and their intermediality presupposes an answer to the oft-repeated question, what is a picture? For one thing, images are also pictures, even if there are other pictures. Second, the historical appearance or debut of images as the result of technical reproductive processes occurred as a specific separation or differentiation in terms of media within the history of pictures. And third, in our media amnesia, we have become accustomed to calling everything that deals with representations of visuality in the broadest sense of the term, a picture. Only against the background of media differentiation does it become clear that paintings and sculptures, on the one hand, and metaphor, symbols, imagined or remembered pictures or mental images, on the other, cannot be subsumed under the same concept of picture. Especially in the intermediate use, the media properties of pictures play the determining role in their media sphere. For this reason, the metaphoric meaning of the term picture is excluded from this discussion. I would like to suggest the following basic definition for the word picture. The term refers to a real-world object that's uh, that represents other real or unreal objects, especially in their absence, without being them. Although specific restrictions might apply to abstract paintings. A picture is always just a picture, no matter what it shows. The uses of pictures beyond this definition, for example, metaphoric, magical or mystical uses, have no relation to their intrinsic properties being the result of different attributions. Pictures as physical objects and representations are characterized by their uh, two-sided form, whereby one side, the form, is determined by the other, the medium. Each side is echoed on the other. The medium in the figural process of its representation and the form in the observation of the medium as a picture. The media or uh, material properties of the canvas and paints used in a, pan a painting or the marble of a sculpture determine the respectively represented forms. The canvas and marble are observable as forms of their materiality and become media of, 
representation only in their use as picture or sculpture. This observation of a picture as a two-sided form is the prerequisite for the idea that the inseparable unit that is the picture can under certain circumstances divide into two forms, one of which, the figurative representation, can be formulated anew under other media conditions. The picture stays behind, for instance, on the wall in the museum, while its image, with other media properties, can be nearly endlessly multiplied and connected to other media forms. Every picture is an object of reality and, as a rule, a product of craftsmanship and artistic production is unique. Pictures are unique occurrences or occurrences of their uniqueness. The artist's signature marks the uniqueness of a visual work of art by reference to its author. The specific picture has a spe specific place, even though it can be moved or transported between sides. Catalogues classify pictures according to the locations in galleries or museums. Pictures themselves are not reproducible, as I said. The copies of a picture are new pictures, whose reference is their model. They are forgeries if they seek to take the place of their model. Copying and forgery do not nullify the uniqueness of the models as long as the new works are recognizable as copies. Otherwise, they become another original picture. Pictures as unique objects in our physical reality that exhibit specific media or material properties cannot be connected in processes of intermediality with other media forms. In other words, the representation of a painting, for instance in a book or a film, by the painting itself is not possible. Images, second. The intermedia reproduction of a picture in another media connection presupposes the fact that the picture is generally reproducible and exhibits media properties that allow it to connect with other media surroundings. What we know is not the case with pictures. Images are media forms generated by pictures that can be removed from the source medium and connected to other media in which they are limitlessly reproducible. An image refers to its media origin, for instance, uh, that, that, that is the original medium, as a picture by repeating its image and conveying traces of its media properties in its form. Images thus formulate the picture by using its image in other media contexts. Here, once again, the electronic reproduction of that, uh, um, of that picture by Paul Klee. You see, of course, just an electronic representation of an image. And uh, here, you, now you can trace back it to uh, the, the model. And uh, you can see, uh, perhaps, you see uh, forms of color, forms of uh, how it is made. Uh, how our painting is, was going on, and so on. Along with their ability to be endlessly duplicated, the process by which images are separated from the pictorial origins or models and become independent artistic entities is, one of, is on the core of the history of the technical production of pictures, actually the production of images to use the discussion's definitions. Initially, this production was not focused on the repetition or artisanal, uh, artisanal or artistic pictures by means of their reproduction. Early technical rep uh, representations are basically prints from mattresses with various media properties such as stone, metal, wood, or for photographs, glass. Often the plate of the matrix was produced as a work of art by a master craftsman, however, the matrix was not the, the intended final picture, but rather the images or prints that were produced using a simple technical or mechanical process. When the printing process is finished and the desired or technically possible quantity of prints had been produced, the matrix could be destroyed, for example, if the addition of the prints was intended to be limited. In some cases, 
The limitation of this duplication has given the print some properties of the original, but one never obtains original pictures from an, uh, from an image. Even valuable wood or copper plate engravings, for instance from Dürer's time, are multiple images of their matrix in the printing process. A similar situation applies to photographs. Even in the case of a restricted edition of prints by the artist, these prints have their origin in a matrix and its ability to endlessly reproduce the same image. The technical printing method shows how the image frees itself, frees itself from its matrix, which as a negative form can transfer its, uh, its media properties through printing onto another medium, for instance paper, that reproduces the media form of the matrix, but not its medium, of course. The medium can be destroyed, but its form has been transferred by means of the printing process, and thus it continues as a form in another medium. You see the printing process. You see the matrix, uh, the stock, and you see how uh, a, new, a new image is taken from that matrix. And it's not the only one, but several, that's a sense of the, uh, of the um, production, several such uh, new images. The intermediality of images is made possible by the process of transformation that occurs between the matrix and the image whereby the represented form is transferred between a negative source, the matrix, and a reproducible positive image. This new trans form is capable of connection to various other media forms. The technical reproduction of original paintings or sculptures assumes that first a matrix must be produced. The technical reproduction of original paintings or sculptures assumes that first a matrix must be produced. Then, using this matrix, the picture can be reproduced in the new media form of its image. This is the historical achievement of the photograph, which has utilized its matrix to transform the world's objects, including physical pictures, into a world of image streams. Walter Benjamin has described this process of transformation with two concepts that can clarify the process from different sides. First, in our cultural history, technical reproduction and duplication has always been connected with the production of a work of art with the help of a matrix, with casting molds, punches or blocks, while unique works of art have generally been irreproducible. In Benjamin's ontological understanding of photography, the photograph, the output of the most advanced reproductive technology, directly repeats the object of reference in its image. It thus corresponds to the, I quote Benjamin, the urge to get hold of an object in very close proximity by way of its picture. Or better, he says, Benjamin's words, or better its image. It's reproduction. Reproduction such as those offered by picture magazines and newsreels differ from pictures. Common to all re reproductive technologies is the fact that they allow multiple images of the models as alike as fingerprints. However, these images lack the authenticity of the unique pictures, which is why Benjamin insists that they are merely images. The second concept that Benjamin proposes to clarify the process behind the history of reproductions is translation. Benjamin describes translation as a form that is already contained within the original and that serves its survival in that it refers back to the original over and over again. This idea of translation can be applied to literary works which have been basically reproducible since Gutenberg, but it can also be related to other media forms, especially nowadays when literary translations increasingly include transformations into other media forms such as films, television series and so on. 
the translation as a form, that is general translatability, is what controls or formulates the media transformation in the reproductive process. The photographic reproduction is also a translation, not of any presumed reality, but rather of the media form of the matrix, a negative form which produces, by means of light prints, positive images of the matrix in the form of its translation. Forms of a translation are elements of all technical reproductive processes that operate in the transformation between the matrix and the images that it formulates. They are intermediate images or quasi-images that transport the forms of media properties as well as elements of their figuration which they realize intermediately. How are these intermediate or quasi-images that are defined by the function in intermediate processes observable? The matrices themselves disappear, or else these intermediate forms are media forms that are completely absorbed by the function in intermediate processes. Basically, these media are exclusively observable in the forms that they generate. They themselves, as media, can be observed only in forms that become transparent through their function. That is, they are observable through their effects, while remaining invisible as media in the blind spot of their perception. Or, in opaque forms that obstruct and possibly nullify their media function, in this way, the medium of the images becomes an image of the medium. Now third, intermediate images. In his media phenomenology, Emmanuel Aloha takes as a starting point Aristotle's question of how the object of perception becomes the perceived object in the act of seeing. It is impossible for the object in its physical concreteness to penetrate the eye and the perceiving consciousness. Thus, in order for an object to be seen, there must be a mediation by something between. Something between object and eye that neither shares the material properties of the object nor belongs to the eye, nor is it, generally speaking, a thing. This between, which Aristotle calls metaxy, is purely a medium of appearance in that it enables the object in the act of perception to appear. It transfers the object as a form, in this man uh, form and in this manner informs the viewer's perception. Quote, Alua again, the metaxy must let the form pass. However, conversely, the form passes only by means of the metaxy. As a medium of appearance, this metaxy, or human, allows its own appearance to be eclipsed. As it, uh, eclipsed, as it were, becoming translucent. End quote. The medium of perception disappears with that which it brings to light as the perceived form. Its transparency turns into opacity when this medium itself appears as a form and becomes performatively descriptive. With the development of the geometrical and mathematical construction of perception, that is in perspective modeling and Renaissance painting, the form through which perception is transmitted was attributed at a, part a, a particular significance for the representation of seeing. The originally diaphanous or transparent medium of transmission, the metaxy between object and eye, eye or consciousness, now becomes the visible form of the formulation of visibility, more or less displacing the mediated object. The medium thus changes from one of transparency to one of opacity. <coughs> Once and again, it's always the same. In Dürer's Unterweisung, instruction, a transparent cloth or velum is stretched between the, of course, motionless object of the perception and the perceiving eye. Visual lines connect every point of the object 
to the eye of the observer or artist. The positions at which they cut through this velum, or are cut by the velum, are conscientiously marked until an image of the object, as it appears to the eye, is generated on the cloth. No longer invisible or diaphanous, but instead increasingly opaque medium of perception, it should enable the perception of the object to appear as the image of its perception, which can serve as a matrix for additional images. From the outset, it has its own media form, a network structure or grid. A grid into which another perceived form of the object is inscribed until it or its own image is hidden by the object of the perception. From this matrix, it is possible to obtain further images which can also be repeated in other media contexts. What comes into being here is an intermediate image whose origin reveals the transition from the transparent or diaphanous medium of the appearance to the opacity of its own image. This interchange between transparency and imagery recurs throughout history of technical reproductions and intermediate images becoming increasingly more important. How then does the photograph operate, this technically reproductive medium that was the first to putatively render superfluous the intervention of the human hand uh, in the image production process, according to Benjamin? The photograph was invented with the intention of accelerating traditional printing methods by means of the exposure of printing plates. Even today, photographs are referred to as prints. Here we are speaking of photographs in the modern sense, of course, following the, the, the uh, introduction of the negative versus positive posture of Fox Talbot's color type. In the camera obscura of the, uh, of the camera, a photomechanically treated glass surface is exposed to light through an objective lens. The negative thus produced can be used afterwards as a matrix for light prints on paper. Photographs are thus images taken from a matrix from which an arbitrary number of photo prints or proofs can be made. With regard to this media constellation, it is difficult to speak of photographs in the ontological understanding as direct fingerprints or traces of reality. They are images of their matrix. A photograph is the image uh, of, of its matrix. It is which appears between a photographic matrix on glass film and so on, and its imprint, which in this form can be endlessly repeated. This operative space is open to interventions and manipulations in the image process. From the outset, the common usability or ubiquitous accessibility of the new technical images enabled by, photo by photography was one of the technique's most outstanding characteristics features. In different dimensions, on different backings and so on, these photographic images could be inserted in complete editions of books, for example. But in this cumulative sense, photographs were not yet an intermediate part of books, in my stronger sense, in my more narrow sense. Up to the end of the 19th century, woodcuts, often based on a photograph, were still preferred to photographs because they could be integrated into a text and be printed together with it. Ultimately, the development of the raster process enabled the direct connection of photographs with the surrounding text using a point structure shared by both, the technique used at first for illustrated magazines, an exemplary intermediate procedure. In this process, the photograph is dissolved into a network of points whose size or density dictates the sharpness or resolution of the representation and whose variations in brightness, so-called grayscale values, results in the shading of surfaces and contours. Whereas the irregular granula granularity of the photomechanical surface is a media property of the photographic image, the additional raster enables the picture to be connected to the point construction of the printed text. The raster 
is a form of translation. Here, the translation of a text structure into a picture structure for the direct connection of the two. It is the use of a velum in the opposite direction. Now, not for the purpose of constructing an image, but rather for the disintegration of the image into the surrounding text. This image printed in halftone can again serve as a matrix for the rotary press and the printing of text image combinations. To reiterate, it is impossible to connect a picture in its physical state with, for example, a book through an intermediate procedure. The separation of the image from its surface and the associated possibilities of different media representations and resolutions are what enable an image to be connected with other media surroundings. The Rustenberg matrix transforms an image into a text that can be printed and read together with the surrounding text. This picture has actually become a media component of another medium, namely the book or magazine. Aristotle assumed that between object in reality and their perception, there existed a certain metaxy, a necessary medium that could transport the appearance of a thing to the eye or the consciousness, but itself remaining invisible, transparent, or diaphanous. Even without its own form, it formulates other forms, allowing them to be perceived. In the velum, this medium has taken a form the network or grid structures of a cloth, the form of which is increasingly covered by what it formulates, the perceived object in this case. Thereby it becomes the matrix of its image, which could be removed from the context of its origin and replicated. For Aristotle, such an appearance always uh, maintained the directness of its link with the perceived object by means of the transparent or diaphanous nature of its medium. The opacity of the velum, in contrast, has blocked the origin of the appearance with its image, its own image. The matrix, thus, has become a machine for second-hand appearances of real-world objects and a reality that becomes increasingly invisible behind the flow of images. At this point, I would like to refer to the distinction that was introduced by Bode and Grusin, again those two, in the discussion of intermediality, which they call remediation. Remediation, like our intermediality, is defined as the repetition of a medium as a form in another medium, a form that demonstrates two tendencies. The first, immediacy, refers to the connection of the media forms that maintains the transparency of the medium, of their connection. In the extreme case, this produces the illusion of a second nature, as can be seen in the representation of immersive rooms. For instance, images that seem to be penetrable, in effect that grew more popular with the advent of cinema. Hypermediacy and intermediate procedures means that the process of media formation itself is observable. An accumulation of various media forms leads to a clustering in close proximity or an overlapping of elements that interact, often without being transparent to each other. The immediacy of a Renaissance painting is based on its perspective construction, which guides the viewer's guise into the depth of the represented space. When the grid of the geometrical construction of the space is superimposed, the result is hypermediacy. The addition of the intermediate image of the matrix disturbs the painting's illusionary depth of space. The image's visibility underneath the grid of lines is threatened, and a new hypermedia aesthetic of geometrical uh, iconic iconicity is generated. If you want to know what a picture this is, it's Masolino's uh, St. Peter healing a cripple in the raising of Tabita. Uh, 1425, but it's not important in that case here. You see, the lines are superimposed on the, uh, the painting, uh, but of course the, paint the painting is constructed by those lines, and after uh, the, the, the painting is uh, ended, 
uh, the process of painting has, has ended, you can uh, put these lines away, you can everything that helps uh, to uh, construct it uh, put away. It's not direct part, these lines are not direct part of the picture, but they are imposed, they are uh, got part of the construction of the picture, but you can't see them anymore. The complexity of the play between transparency and opacity and the appearance of the image becomes evident with the modern translucent pictures provided by photographs, slides and film images. In these cases, the matrix in the form of a slide or diapositive transmits via its projection into a screen its image as a light print, enabling its appearance at a new location. The light assumes the form or information of the matrix, removing the image and invisibly transporting its form to the screen where it, as an immaterial image, becomes visible or appears. The matrix is left behind in the projector and can be forgotten, often hidden in the, be behind a wall. The significant event is the appearance of the image. Between the screened matrix of the slide and the projected image, a space of trans transformation is bridged in which the transparent, diaphanous, intermediate image is transported as pure light-based information of form to the screen upon which it ap appears. In fact, the image can be made visible at any point along the projection beam if the transparency of the intermediate image is disturbed by an opaque medium, a body, or interrupted by an opaque body. Clearly, the projected light contains the intermediate image as a trans uh, transparent, diaphanous form until it is made visible by the intervention of an opaque medium. The screen, in normal cases. A film projection is nothing more than slides projected 24 times per second. The matrix of the film strip projects a series of frames that appear on the projection screen as a single moving picture. The figurative difference within a coded margin allows the illusion of movement in a cinematic moving picture, while without this difference, no movement becomes visible despite the continued projection. The individual frames are projected on top of one another, as in a palimpsest, the transparency allows them to blend into one another and the differences between them are seen as movement. Here you have four stages of uh, differences. Every new uh, slide, in this case, or uh, film image, uh, is different to that one before. And what you see, they, they are motionless, of course. We know they are motionless, pr uh, 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 projected. And uh, what we see as movement is nothing but the difference between these uh, single images, one after the other. If there's no difference between those images, you can't see movement. It's a still, it's a, a freeze frame. While the projection, the projection, the movement of the projector goes on. In the beam of light from the projector to the screen, they are mere forms, transparent, diaphanous, intermediate images, metaxi that are condensed only on the opaque screen or any intervening body into a single moving picture. Visible mo a moving picture on the screen owes ex its existence to a disturbance in the transparency of the intermediate images in the light beam after they have been detached from the matrix at 24 times per second. This disturbance, which allows the intermediate images to become visible, can take place anywhere in the beam of light. I will give you 
nice, I hope nice, uh, example. Roberto Rossellini's short film, Idi Batezza, perhaps you know this, uh, from 1963, uses this idea of interference in the film projection to emphasize the disturbance and the psychic uh, projection of his hero. Idi Batezza tells the story of an American who falls in love with a stewardess uh, whom he records with his film camera during a layover in Bangkok. Because she avoids him, he must be content to meet her in the form of these film pictures, which he projects in his hotel room. He positions himself in the projection beam, using himself as the screen and attempting to unite the object of his desire, meanwhile making her image, which he embodies, appear on his body between the projector and the screen. three stages of this film, and I'll show you the sequence then, then, as a film sequence. Well, it's very bad. that uh, the information uh, which you see on the screen is everywhere in the beam and you can show it. You have to put your hand in the beam and you have a picture on your hand. See? But you can't see it as long, as far, uh, until the moment you have it uh, stopped, stopped, perhaps. Now, uh, fourth, digital matrix images. I turn once again back to Aristotle, to the ancient philosopher, for an object to be, uh, a, to be able to appear, it was essential that the substance of the object be realized as a mere possibility in light of its form or shape. The form of the thing is that which is real, its substance, or its materiality, is a mere possibility. It is a question of the lighting. That allows, uh, that allows forms to become detached from the objects that appear as they are. Even today, the entire analog world of pictures and images is a world of appearances, whose forms have left behind the things that they formulate. The medium is the light that illuminates the objects and projects their forms. In my opinion, this ancient model of making the world appear has returned in the cinematographic process. A great deal has changed in media history during recent years, but, I quote, it's still the light, whether it comes for a start from the sun, an electric lamp, or a video screen, which is the origin of all pictures and representations which presents and explains the world to us. Without light, no picture. Between the material world and the human eye, light, itself without form, shows us objects by their forms, transmitting them to our consciousness. And the space between the film projector and the screen, it is light that transports the form of the matrix and the virtual intermediate images and then renders them visible on the screen without light, no film. The French new media scholar Edmond Couchot claims 
that the evolution of the computer and digital data processing has allowed the uh, development of a, I quote him, new kind of picture that no longer owes anything to light, at least not in its production. These are the new synthetic or numerical pictures. In its creation, the synthetic picture is completely calculated by the computer." End quote. This also applies to the light in such pictures, which, as an algorithmically programmed effect, forms an element of the figurative surface. Lighting here detaches no forms from objects in order to transmit their appearance. Rather, it is itself a programmable form that can be distributed in a few points or extensively in the picture's surface. This picture does not require the constitutive difference that formerly uh, separated the picture from the image and the image from its matrix. It was these differences in media forms that enabled the integration of other such forms through intermedia operations. The digital or synthetic picture no longer differentiates an image from its matrix, but it is itself a matrix image, or in the term of Couchot, l'image matrice. It is its matrix as a picture. The representation of this matrix image is often hard to distinguish from photographs, although it gives it, uh, itself away through the depiction of impossible points of view or unreal objects. The matrix image does not organize processes of intermediality in the way that films do as a combination of photographic images, sounds, writing, visual and narrative structures, and so on. Rather, it is from the, uh, the start a virtual intermedia construction of media forms that it melts with its own universal form of the computer medium. Because these synthetic pictures can presuppose no true referential re reality and also claim no substantial reality for themselves, the performative data processing deals only with a pure forms and their algorithmic relations in a defined pixel space. If analog photographs become the basis for the digital representation of objects, for example, for the picture-based modeling of a three-dimensional data space, then two different media forms must be reduced to a common denominator in the algorithmic calculation. Sounds and colors are media forms that are not formulated additively as in analog films, but instead as media forms that are algorithmically broken down and directly tied together with data from other media forms. Because the matrix image no longer recognizes the constitutive difference between picture and image, or the object, its transformation and the form of its appearance, there are no intermediate images in which a transformation operates either transparently or opaquely to realize connections to other media forms. By means of digital compositing, point for point, pixel for pixel, other media forms are inserted into the actual matrix image as they are substituted. Encoding uh, procedures such as coma keying, for instance, by these forms. Computer-generated representations themselves also use grid structures. Grid structures in a network for the arrangement of pixels in the picture space or in the development, for example, of polygon structures for the modeling of the three-dimensional bodies. In every phase, such grids are components of the program picture process itself, rather than individual media forms added to supplement the analog perspective construction that will disappear after contributing the spatial effect. A grid of polygons is no velum that can be withdrawn so that the completed picture appears behind it. It is the picture itself.
Dreams by uh, Carl Sims from 1988. And uh, it's uh, an example uh, that uh, the grid structure uh, operates the picture. You can't withdraw it. You can't take it away from that uh, picture. While on the other hand, this is Dürer, faces under grids. Uh, here, uh, the grid is used to construct uh, the faces, the picture of the faces, and then they are uh, withdrawn, not needed anymore. That's a basic difference, I think, uh, in, uh, concerning the construction of uh, pictures, uh, analog or dialog uh, um, digitally. The intermediality of digital matrix pictures takes place as a combinatorics of coded data complexes that represent different media forms but nevertheless originate from the same media form of the computer. Many concepts left over from the, from the analog era have lost their meaning in digital proce procedures because these procedures are no longer defined based on media differences. If they are still addressed as normal pictures or images, as, a, as usual, it is also because digital pictures can appear to be analog pictures without actually being them. Nevertheless, the appearance of their forms is a programmed pretense of the exclusive reality of the data stream that universally established them in nothing but visual effects. I would call these uh, pictures or images no more images or pictures, but visual effects. Or in the words of Morpheus in answer to Neo's question, quote, what is the matrix? It's control. The matrix is a computer generated dream world built to keep us under control. And the matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window, when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. In the Wachowski's film, The, Machine, uh, the Machines Control Humanity, a world of people who experience a computer-generated false world as their augmented reality. These who belong to it cannot make a distinction between truth the make-believe of the programmed matrix. Their matrix has ceased to be a picture. It has become, only in the film of this name, the entirety of the perceived reality. apologize for this too long uh, speech, I think. Um, thank you for this very dense <laughs> lecture. And now the floor is open for questions. Professor Pech, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating lecture and the interesting etymology of the different kinds of forms and the Aristotelian-based interpretation um, of the medium and also the collapse of that medium. I was wondering, uh, in fact, you did not mention the problem of perspective, which uh, uh, in, is in fact, in my view, what is constructed in the pre-digital paintings. And I think it's also a problem in Durer's work. Uh, so uh, what happens in the digital world when this distinction, this tripartite distinction between the object 
object and the medium and the reality collapse it, would you say that this also maybe since it changes the nature of the, our perception of reality because there is no longer this veil or more veil of perception, would it not, would this influence the, well, nature of reality itself? I think it's, I spoke about the perspective construction of Renaissance reality paintings. Um, uh, you see these lines and, and uh, the way um, death in the, in, the, in, the, in the picture was constructed. Uh, my argument was these lines should be taken away after the perspective uh, 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 picture uh, was constructed. That's uh, the one. And I think every digital construction of, a, of an image can construct uh, perspective uh, representation. It can uh, du duplicate uh, the uh, Renaissance um, painting, way of painting, no problem. And you are, you are uh, but uh, with other means, with other, with other techniques, yes. um, and with algorithms, of course, it, it is calculated and no more painted. And um, I think, um, in the fir first hand, um, the object, the paintings, or the representation of the world is changed. Really? If you go to the, to the cinema, you see um, a normal film, and it can, it can be a f photographed film, it can be an analog film, uh, until you see, oh, it's impossible, it's impossible. This view, from this point of view, is impossible and uh, this uh, um, acceleration is impossible, and so on. You have, uh, um, you have uh, uh, pointers where you can see, oh, this is, must be uh, digital, digitally made and not analogically. But you see it in the images. Whether it changes our own perception of reality, I don't know, it didn't change mine. <laughs> my, my, my behavior, my habit, my, uh, uh, my uh, going on to the, to the reality by um, iPad, since I have an iPad, uh, changed a little. Uh, I, I'm looking much more to my emails and, and uh, I have it at hand and, um, and so on. But uh, my picture, my image of reality, how I see reality is forehand not, not really changed. I think it's a myth that uh, the media changed our view of reality in a radical way. But you have new objects, you, uh, objects which maybe did not exist that way before. And you also, you may not have the construction of the Renaissance period, you may not have that kind of perspective, but you've got the grid in digital uh, uh, construction. So you do have some kind of a medium um, yes, you need no, no grid, and uh, or you need a grid in another way in, in digital construction of a, of a, of a body, of a three-dimensional body, in, uh, in digital making of images. Yes? Um, my main uh, um, argument was that this grid is part of the picture. <laughs> Yes, okay. it's uh, make okay. invi made invisible by multiplying it again and again and again, and uh, you can't see it anymore, but it is there. Yes? In Renaissance uh, painting, uh, it has constructed this death of, of, of uh, uh, the picture, but then it's put away, it's not needed anymore. It's a okay. uh, means of, mm. of painting. Thank you. Yeah, um, could you shortly um, again explain what you meant by quasi-image? Is uh, was it like um, what you called uneigentliche images, like the mattresses? Is it the same? Or is um, what I mean is, uh, it's an image that is not used as an image, but as a prerequisite for an image. Yes, it looks like an image. It's the um, uh, negative of a photograph. It looks like an image, but we don't use it as image, but we use it as a print um, um, uh, basic uh, basis for making real images or photographs. Yeah? It's a prerequisite. 
for making images as we call them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's, it's um, another form is uh, images as pure information, these intermediate images. Uh, they are there as forms, they are transported as information of what later on on the, on the screen uh, is to be seen. But you can't see them, they are not images. Yeah? They are quasi images as media forms that transport information uh, to be seen on the screen. Yeah? A, form, mm -hmm. a form of image that is prerequisite to the real image that later on you call image or photograph or so on. You, have, you throw your negatives, I did so. When I had ne negatives, I throw them away because they uh, destroy themselves, they get red and, and, and that's terrible, you can't use them anymore. But if you have the photographs, and uh, uh, it's enough, it's, it's okay, you have that in your album and so on, but you don't need uh, the, um, the negatives an anymore. Hmm? Mm -hmm. um, hello. Uh, you've mentioned that there can be an intermediate relationship, relation between picture, a picture and other media. I was wondering if when listening to an audio guide in a museum while looking at a picture is not actually establishing this kind of relation between two different media. And uh, I was wondering if there aren't are, are other examples with, which could be considered intermediate relations between pictures and uh, other media. Yes. Uh, what I mean uh, is that you can't integrate another medium, a picture, into another medium because it's a physical object. Yeah? So in, in, in the audio guide, uh, you have a media in front of a picture and it helps you to hear something about it, but it's not part of the picture. The picture is not part of that audio guide. See, it's a relation, of, co of course, yes, but uh, you need not the picture. If you, if you have uh, the d director of the mu museum and head, he will explain you what ab what's about uh, that uh, picture, perhaps better than the audio guide can. Yeah? But uh, you see, the audio guide is not part of the picture or, or any other medium, but it's part of the situation, the communication over and with uh, this picture. It's something else. Uh, it's true. I was ac actually thinking about the situation when you uh, have a certain soundtrack, a classical piece, a uh, composition, which would enhance your experience of a certain picture, pretty much like in soundtrack uh, uh, pieces in films. But yes, I understand the difference you're making. Thank you. It's, it's quite clear. <laughs> you can't put it in this... In, 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 uh, uh, there are some uh, avant-gardist um, um, uh, filmmakers who uh, try to, in, um, to put uh, um, moth, uh, uh, moth real, real things uh, on the on on the uh, strip film strip, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's um, what you show, what you see later on the projection is not these. Uh, animals or what else, or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you see there, there are um, traces they left on the media. Yes, thank you very much for your um, for your paper. In a sense, I think it's. I have a suspicion that you are, in a in a sense, provoking us all all we intermediaries here by saying that what we thought, what we think, we experience when we, for instance, see a film with a, a represented not picture, but image uh, is not intermediality, uh, or, or not, or that that the experience has nothing to do with the original picture. So, is there a kind of hidden agenda behind something you uh, we should be aware of here? Because, it, uh, to be honest, uh, I have, I think I can follow most of your um, uh, subtle distinctions and your argument and so on, but. In another sense, I would say that I do experience very uh, intensely, I could experience very intensely uh, the presence of an image, even though it's not a picture, in a film, for instance. Uh, first, uh, I made the experience 
speaking about intermediality, for instance, in films, um, it's an intermedia intermediate situation when somebody visits a museum. Because you see uh, pictures there um, as part of the scenery and so on. Oh, there are pictures, and so pictures are mentioned in the film, it's intermediality. Yeah? I say it's not. It's just, it's just uh, uh, like a street or what you were, buildings or what, what else. These are photographed objects, and so they are images and taken mm. into, mm. into mm. a film. It's not intermediality in that radical sense. I want to, uh, to use it. It's a proposal for a method. It's a mm. proposal for being more earnest, more, more, more serious uh, concerning uh, the, uh, um, using uh, terms and in that case the term of intermediality. And you have to ask what is a medium in an intermediate reality, uh, relationship? What should be medium? Is a medium a thing of reality, a real thing? It's impossible to combine it with other media in that sense. Media in that form, and uh, as also Aristotle is new, um, is something that has no own qualities, but is something that transports qualities of others to be integrated in other forms, and so on. Yes, it's um, I can um, uh, to be true. It's 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 Luhmann. It's Luhmann. Uh, the, the notion of of the relationship between media and form, and um, and. Uh, the situation that only observer can distinguish between uh, between things by observing them, giving them meaning, and um, uh, what he sees, what we see, is a world of forms. And what we do is uh, to, to find out what are the reasons why these forms are so and not others. And the reason is that they are produced by certain media, stone or what else. In the moment, that's the moment, in the moment we, we, we uh, ask uh, after the media, we have and try to describe it, and because we observe it, we have forms again, forms that are produced by other media, and so we have to go on looking for media, all what is uh, necessary to produce forms, that, forms of our total world. It's not. Uh, uh, reduced to uh, uh, communication situations uh, like we often do when we speak about media and in, uh, institutions or uh, in, in the realm, the framework of communication situation. Sorry. And what in case you bring these different media? Uh, I mean, there seems to be, a, 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 I think you're, um, argument is based on the assumption that we could always make a clear, um, we, that we always have a clear sense of the ontology of a medium. And that we also have a clear uh, sense of um, an illusion. What in case we bring these different media together in their specific materialities on the stage of a theatre? Or would you consider theatre in that sense then not as a medium? I'm not uh, neither centralist nor uh, um, uh, transcendental uh, mm -hmm. thinking type. Um, but uh, I think your own experience of reality shows you that you have uh, a connection to real things by touching them, by seeing them by hearing them and so on. Yes. They are mediated by senses and uh, you have not direct connection to them. They are always me me mediated and this mediation shows that you have to ask what is, what does media take, how does media take part in your observing, in your experience of yeah. the world. But wouldn't you agree that when it comes to experiencing something as real, touch is of a different kind than seeing things. Of course. Of course, because uh, the, the uh, experience of a medial mediation is different. 
different. You have a, a, a different um, uh, uh, experience with stone, for instance. Uh, if you touch it, end of stone, perhaps in a, in a, in a picture by Magritte, where a big stone is, is uh, free hanging in, in, in the air. Yeah? You see it's, it, 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 it is in, in, in the air. Uh, you have the impression it must be heavy. But it's a contra uh, uh, contradictory situation and so on. And you have to find out what is meant. Is it, is it uh, um, discussion of the heaviness of, of the uh, materiality of the stone and, and so on. Yeah? Uh, I think um, the problem, the problem, except from Aristotelism and, and uh, uh, philosophical traditions, the problem is a new one with the new media because you have um, the construction of an illusionary world that uh, only by visibility, by, by, by your senses, including the touch sense, is, um, con uh, um, confronts you with a world that is uh, mediated in a second-hand way. Yeah? And you have, uh, like that guy who uh, tries to find out uh, uh, to looks to the uh, crystal uh, ball of the victim. Where is the real? Where is reality? We now ask for reality in a new way. That's perhaps uh, changed our, our relationship to the world. Yes? And many films and Matrix, for instance, play with that uh, new consciousness, with that um, feeling yes? that we uh, live in an illusionary world. And uh, that's new, it, yeah, but, but it mm. strengthens, it, it makes necessary the more the notion of media, the notion that this world is mediated and we can reconstruct it uh, in the way uh, how it is uh, made. But I think it's generally a problem of our perception of our living in the world uh, to, have to have to do it with media and, and with some sort of mediation. Okay. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to stop here because uh, we are running uh, late. But I will remind you that there is a scheduled a round table concluding discussion where you can ask all the questions uh, uh, that you did not <laughs> manage to ask uh, from all the keynote speakers of this conference. So hopefully. <laughs> Thank you for your presence and let's go and have our final round of papers. <laughs>